Good evening. This is Avram Shira for Web Yeshiva on Facebook Live. Well, we've got a new thing going tonight. We had uh, technical difficulties uh, getting onto the website of Web Yeshiva, which has been a wonderful organization. And I've been there 13 years, and this is the first time this has ever happened that we shifted over to Facebook. I hope we didn't step on anybody's toes, but it shouldn't be. We're here to learn Torah, and that goes beyond all these little personal boundaries. We are going to be learning from the Sefer Baal Shem Tov on the section of Tefillah. And it is, uh, I don't know if everybody has the same book, it's Machon Ziv. If anybody wants to look it up. And the begin, we're going to talk about the idea of Kavana in context with a statement from the rabbis, which is very, uh, quite an astounding statement. He begins... Shabbati b'shem Morizal. We heard in the name of the Baal Shem Tov, and he brings the Gemara from uh, Brachot. Amar Rabbi Zera, Kala Omer Shama Shema Mashtikim Otov. In the middle of the prayer, if someone repeats the word Shema when they're saying the morning blessing or the evening blessing of Shema, and they say Shema, uh, Shema, like they repeat themselves, it happens. We're human beings, right? It says, tell him, shh, shh. You know, you've heard that in a synagogue more than once. You know, be quiet, shh. And what's going on? Why is the, the Jewish world all excited? Because he repeated the word Shema. You know, you could repeat the, the word Shema 10,000 times if you want. It's, a, it's the, uh, the highest mantra there is. Uh, you know, or if people don't like the word, some people don't like the word mantra, so we could call it a... Uh, a Kavana focus, right? But nonetheless, Rabbi Zera is not just any old guy. He's a, ta- he's a, a Tana, and he's uh, one of the great rabbis of the Talmud Bavli. He, he fasted 40 days just to forget the Torah from his mind so that he could learn new Torah. So we can not really even comprehend what that means. But anyways, he said, make the guy be quiet. So in that Gemara, it says, Amar later of Papa la Baye. So these two other great rabbis are going to argue about this. Dilma Mikara lo date. Why do we tell him to be quiet? Because perhaps he didn't have proper kavana to begin with. And therefore, since he didn't have proper kavana to begin with, he, he repeated the word Shema. Well, that sounds like a good thing. If I say Shema, and I realize I wasn't thinking about the creator of the universe I wasn't receiving the, the, the yoke of Shemayim and all the mitzvot. Well, then I better say it again. That's the suppositional question that Rav Papa is asking Abaya, who were two other massive sages that we have no idea of the Torah they had. So Amar Leit, so Abaya answered him, Chavruta klape Shemaya mi'ika. Well, what are you telling me? This guy's like a chavruta with God. <laughs> you know, like when you learn chavruta, you'll say, what did you say? What did you say? I didn't hear you. Could you repeat that? You know, that's how chavruta is. Shalom, Lin. Welcome. Uh, I hope uh, all of you can get there on the class. And uh, this class will be recorded for 24 hours. And so we will continue. So he said to him, who are you to change the laws of the Torah and say Shema twice and then tell me that he's correcting himself in the middle of his prayer? The Baal Shem Tov is bringing all of this in the context of having proper intention and in prayer. And uh, what are you, the Chavruta of God? You know, you're up there on, on, the, on the pearly gates uh, learning Torah with God every day. Is that your job? The ilo kivendate mikara, and if a person doesn't sit with the proper kavana before he opens his mouth to make a blessing on an apple, much less say Shema Yisrael, the most important words in Judaism. If he doesn't, to begin with, have the proper kavana, machinian lebe b'marzafta de nafcha, they strike him with steel rods. The the, the rods that a, a steel worker would use. Doesn't sound very pleasant, right? You know what's going on in it's the a world. pretty intense... Uh, 
punishment for, <laughs> for repeating a word of prayer. Halavai, we repeat the words until our hearts open, which is actually a very deep meditation that uh, even Rabbi Yosef Karo, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, used uh, verses from the Mishnah to contact an angel. Because every, every Mishnah has an angel. And that's a deep subject that we've talked about in elsewhere in, in Torah. Um, but the basic idea is that God spoke the Torah through Moses. And we say that every word that God utters creates an angel. And so a pasuk is laden with angels. We just don't see them. And remember, an angel is a channel, of a conduit of the, fi- of the infinite down to the finite. Let's demystify it, right? And so he used to say a, a, a pasuk over and over, and it would bring an angel to him. And that's how he wrote the Shulchan Aruch, Rabbi Yosef Karl. So, you know, don't think that these guys were just dealing with halachot all day long. And, um, okay, so here they're, they're saying if he repeats himself, hit him with a, a steel rod. It doesn't sound nice. Well, why? You hit him until he gets his das lined up. So this sounds like the old-time religion. This sounds like the kind of religion I didn't want to sign up for. You know, that you... <laughs> they, they, you know, they... I'm afraid, folks, that they're... They don't have all the PC things down, you know, that they still hit kids on the hands and make mistakes, whatever. But the point is, these two rabbis are arguing about what you do and why you do it when you don't have kavana. Now, the Talmud is written in a way to shock us a lot of times, and it expects us to understand that. Remember, it expects us that nobody's going to walk into the Beit Midrash and hit you with a steel rod because you didn't. You said Shema twice. And if you say Shema twice, who's going to hear you? Maybe some people, and maybe an old-timer will say, shh, shh, you know. <laughs> but still, we're here to learn what's really going on behind the scenes. So, Hiksha Mori Zal. Beautiful, the Baal Shem Tov, being who he was, he could bring a kushia on the girsa of the Talmud that we just learned. What did he say? Well, we still don't have an answer. That's what he says to this kushia. We don't understand why they're hitting him. We don't understand why they tell him to be quiet. We don't understand. Why they're treating the subject of fixing your consciousness, your focus on the words of prayer deserves such activity. It's a big busha to be in a big Knesset and to have other people tell you to be quiet. It's not a pleasant thing. And so, Mikomakom the Baal Shem Tov continues, Dilma, Mikara, Lo Chaven. So perhaps, nevertheless, he from the beginning, he didn't have Kavana. Now, how many times a day does this happen to us? How many times a day do I pick up the apple, Baruch Hashem, and I put the apple in my mouth and I'm saying, where was I? Who was I talking to? Was I really talking to the creator of the universe to thank him for the apple? When I say Shema Israel, am I really talking to the entire reality saying, listen Israel, there's one God and that's the whole story. So we know how hard Kavana can be when, when you're practicing Judaism on a regular basis all the time. In the beginning, sometimes it's easier to have Kavana because it's so new, it's fresh in your mind and you're, you're aware of what you're doing. Because you're talking to the entire universe as one living being. Okay? That's a heavy deal. And the Baal Shem Tov is, is arguing and he's saying, so let's say he still didn't have Kavana. And he, and he gives another perush, beautiful. If you and it's really kind of along the lines that I was just saying. Let's say you pick up the apple, and and you say Baruch, and you're gonna eat that apple, and you're right. Wait a minute, Baruch. I who's what's Baruch? Do I know what that word means? Do I understand what I'm trying to accomplish by saying the word Baruch? Do I understand what I'm trying to do when I say Shema, Shin, Mem, Ayin? Do I know what a Shin is? That the Shin is the connection between Abba and Ima in the Olam of Atzilut. The Mem is the connection of Chesed and Gavor and, and, and Atzilut. And the Ayin is, is, uh, is it's elsewhere on the Tree of Life because all the 22 letters connect all the Sphero. Do I know what I'm really saying? Of course not. 
I'm calling on it because that's what I was taught. And hopefully after 60 years of learning Kabbalah, maybe I'll get in there and actually experience the awesome reality of what Hebrew is and how the Hebrew letters are concentrated capsules of God's light. It's not, you know, what we think. When we want to open up one of those capsules, you'll never talk Davin the same again. Trust me. Okay. So, let's say he said Shema the second time to fix his first lack of Kavona. So why would you tell the guy to be quiet? Why would you hit him with a stick? Va'od kashe, another kushia. See, the Baal Shem Tov, he, he sees a chassid because he's bringing kushiot against this whole strict understanding of, of Torah practice. He's trying to find the chassid in it. The deeper meaning. Va'od kashe, lama nakat rebi zera. Davka Omer Shema. Why did Rabbi Zera bring the example of repeating the word Shema? He could have brought it at any word of the prayer. And why did he bring Shema twice as an example of a place where a person didn't have Kavana, so he needed to try to fix it in the middle of saying it? You know, it's a beautiful thing just to catch yourself not having Kavana. Do you know that is a very high Kavana? To catch yourself not having Kavana. <laughs> you know? It's one of those uh, circular things that you, you, by understanding you don't have kavana, you immediately fix your kavana. If you stop in your prayer and ask, where am I? Who am I talking to? That's, that's huge. That, regular, that hooks you straight back up to Hashem. Because your mind is your connector. Your mind is the... Is the the so you know, it's not the socket. What's the other side? It's the plug that goes in the socket of heaven. Now we know it, well, we have to have fix our minds, right? Because we want that plug to fit nice and pull down some, some uh, electricity from, from heaven. So let's go forward. And he continues with what we just said, why not another verse somewhere else in the, in the prayer? Ober ma inyan kabalat ol shemayim. Now he's going to explain to us this idea of receiving the yoke of heaven. Now this is a very standard kavana that's taught when we all first learning Torah. We're receiving the O. Oh, I'm no longer a human being. I'm an ox. And they're putting this leather O oh on my shoulders and saying, now plow the field, baby. Let's dig up some soil, you know. And, it, and davening is like that. If anybody knows, when the heart's closed, you feel like your, your, your heart is like that hard soil that does not want to break for any axe or any pick or any, any ox with a plow. Okay, so we want to receive that old machut shemayim. Ve'inyan ki adam mechuyav la'amin ki malokal ha'aretz kivodo yiparach. Of course, we are obligated to to remember, to believe, the Baal Shem Tov says, believe that the world is filled with His glory, that if you're God, there cannot be any place without you. Understand. There's no such thing as being God over here and not God over there. Right, it's a famous phrase from Kabbalah, there is no place without Him. And all thoughts. All thoughts. Shel Adam, of a person. Yesh po mitziyuto yidbarach. Outrageous. The reality of God is in every human thought. You know, I wish I heard this when I was 19. I wouldn't have had to cross America four times looking for God. V'kol makshavahu kol and every thought that a human being has is a full span of the sphere of life. Why? Because a thought requires the mind, the, fir the word processor, the heart, the driver, right? The emotional push of your thoughts and the body itself, your mouth, the tongue, lips, teeth, etc. to produce the sound. Well, along with air, earth, water and, you know, maybe a little earth, wind and fire. That's an old joke, folks. You, you, you hope you'll bear with me. So it's a koma shlema. Your whole body is going into the prayer on a spiritual level. 
Beit Askovet Tfila. And when a person lifts up his thoughts at the time of working and doing prayer, we know a, a, a negative thought, he calls them an evil thought here. Evil is a, is a relative word, but we know that there definitely exists. Don't get confused by this new liberal interpretation I've heard of, well, there really is no evil, it's all relative. Actually, there is evil, but it is relative. So they got it half right. Because what's evil for a tzaddik, for us, might be good. You know, to show up late for shul, I, I'm thrilled to get to shul. For a tzaddik to be late for shul, he's like, what happened? So there, there is a relativity to it. But <laughs> we're not talking about that kind of evil. But, and, and this uh, strange thought, he el adam the takna lalota. It comes to a person in your prayer, dafka. Specifically in your prayer, the strange thought comes because that's the time you're hooking up. That's the time your plug's going in the socket, and and that that strange thought. Guess what it has inside it? A spark of God, a spark of life force that emanated from the Ein Sof and came all the way down into your brain. And it went into, you know, stock reports, or my resentments, or some other strange thought that I don't really want to carry around inside. Well, that thought is a, is a, a spark of Hashem, but it's closed over with a garment. And those garments are the things of this world. And they come, the Baal Shem Tov says, Dafka, specifically when we're praying. And it's coming because it wants you to send it back to heaven. So how do you do that? How do I send the thought back to heaven? I can't, I can't get to heaven. I'm trying to get to heaven. I don't want to stay too long, you know. I want to come back here. But But if a person does not believe in this system of the elevation of the sparks, the strange thoughts, and bringing them back to heaven, if you don't believe in it, like who's, are you a bad person? It's a new idea for a lot of people. So now he answers the question. If I don't believe that my thoughts, strange thoughts that come in prayer, are actually completely coming back to be elevated, I have not received the true yoke of heaven. Right? It's not a, just about... I'm receiving on myself the yoke of the mitzvot. I got to keep the mitzvot best I can. And I received the mission uh, as a Jew to carry the name of God in the world, no matter the cost or the suffering. Certainly, we have enough history about that. But it's this more precise Kabbalistic idea about the elevation of the power that we invest in the wrong places. Well, they come right back that power and says, Abraham, you forgot about me and all these sparks. They want to go back to where they came from because that's the nature of the entire creation. You know, it's like it's like the light of God is traveling into the world, but it's it wants to go back all the time. And our souls are like this. And by the way, it's a very deep thing. That a lot of times people feel like they don't want to be in this world. They want to die, you know, God forbid. The people that even want to take that job on themselves. They want to leave this planet. It's a horrible thing, right? But the soul is made to go back. The soul is stretched down into your body. And it's constantly pulling us. Oh, I want to get out of here. I don't like this world. I don't like the, the, the things I got to deal with here. This is a normal thing for people. And people suffer because of that tension between being here and not and, and not wanting to be here. Because the higher soul always wants to go back to Hashem. The higher soul is only willing to be here because we're doing mitzvot. And that means having kavanah to do mitzvot. And ha we talked about this in other times and places. That you're picking up the phone to call someone and say, how, how you doing? How you feeling? How you doing with the, the virus all out there in the crazy world? That's called a mitzvah, because you're showing compassion to another Jew. And, and so on and so forth. So everything we can do 
Everything we do can be connected to a mitzvah. If you if you boil an egg for your for your husband or your wife, that's also a mitzvah. But I have to call it that. I have to give it the name, mitzvah. Now, what is this? Like a little detail thing? You're pulling on me here. You know, I have to call it a mitzvah, and then it's a mitzvah. But it's not really called making your wife an egg because she's hungry, she's tired. No. By calling it a mitzvah, you're making the connection to the higher will and bringing it to the lower will. Plenty of people want to make an egg, make a cup of coffee for someone they care about in the morning. But when I know I'm doing it for God, from God, with his egg, with his coffee and his hot water and the electricity that heated it and everything else is going on in the story, come on. You've just brought God into all those places. That's Kabbalat O Mahut Shemayim. And so it's not just a little word game we're playing here. That I'm trying to, you know, psych myself into it, or I'm trying to, you know, erase that feeling in my heart like I don't want to be doing this at all. Why should I have to make you a cup of coffee? I can't even get my own coffee. <laughs> you, know, you know, in the morning, anything's possible. You know, those early morning thoughts where you don't want to be awake even. So we understand this tension that's happening between the upper and the lower soul is the place where we suffer. It's that friction between the two, the two wills. Now... It's given many names in Kabbalah. We call it the Yetzirah and the Yetzir Tov, the good inclination and the evil inclination. In English, we can call it the higher soul and the lower soul. It's not about the names, folks. It's about the experience. And this experience creates that empty space inside in the heart. And that hurts. But at least now I know why I feel empty. I remember being, a, a, you know, in college, junior, high school, feeling empty inside. I didn't have Torah. I didn't have mitzvot. I kind of believed there was something with a capital S. You know, they call him God. I don't know, but there's got to be something making this thing work. Even as bad as it might look. But I always felt this emptiness. And now I find it here. The emptiness that we feel is this stress inside between wanting to do God's will and not wanting to do God's will and I'm split up in the middle and then we can understand why you get this sensation of wholeness and oneness when we knock out that negative voice we knock out that part of us that doesn't want to contemplate the unity of the creator when we say Shema Yisrael the part of me that doesn't want to go to the synagogue the part of me that doesn't want to put on a kippah. You know, the part of me that doesn't want to say hi to you on the street. It's constantly interesting to me how you have a, you're in a you're good mood, you're smiling, you're walking down the street, and you look at somebody, you're kind of like trying to catch their eye to, to even give them a nod. Just a nod, you know, not a good morning, shalom aleichem, manishma, or, you know, how you doing, what's happening in Manhattan today. No. Even that is a commandment of the Torah. With Shammai, Hazakain, the elder Shammai, who was the head of Beit Shammai, a famous sage from a long time ago, you know, it says, He said, receive every man with a good face. And you know what? He's known for his very strict interpretations. He's known for the guy who told the... the, the well, someone said, teach me the whole Torah on one foot, and he, said, and he knocked him down, <laughs> out of the room. That's a, that's a tough guy. That's a, a, a Gavura Dick kind of guy. The guy, you know, he's the one who told us to receive people with a nice face. Why? Because probably he experienced what it's like not to. Right? And so, the Baal Shem Tov's teaching us that we need to have faith in, in God being in our thoughts. Now, this is a hard place for people. A lot of people. Because if he's in my thoughts, well, where am I? I get wiped out of the picture. 
And then I'm, I'm then I'm sitting there all day long thinking, which God is which thought is God? Where's God in my thoughts? How do I figure this out? And no, that's not the way we're supposed to approach it. It's not supposed to make <laughs> to make us crazy. But we know that he he's like when you turn on the the oven and the electricity comes in, you don't talk to the electricity in your oven. You don't think about the gas flowing through your car when you're driving your car. But he's the power behind all the powers. It's Ain Sof. It has no boundary whatsoever. But it creates it, that Ain Sof, that infinity, creates all these vessels that constrict it down into things like electricity, into thoughts, into water, into the electromagnetic system that runs this whole planet, surrounds us. He's the power behind all the powers. That's all I need to know. And that's receiving the true yoke of heaven. Okay, so Rabbi Zera, we're trying to answer up Abaye and Rabba and, and Rabbi Zera, etc. And what does the Baal Shem Tov teach us? Amnam im yada shisham gamkein hu metziut Hashem itparach lo ayat zarik lomar shnei pamim shema. Now he gives us a great answer why he, you don't need to say shema twice. Amazing. That if you said it the first time and you realized I had no kavana, I wasn't even here. I was, you know, back at the grocery store or wherever I was. If I really believe that God is in every thought, I don't need to say it twice. Even if it wasn't the, the most powerful arrow shot into the heart of heaven. Because I know he's still there. Because I couldn't even have a thought if he wasn't there. V'zel tzachot lashon ashas. And this is the purity of the language of the 60 masechtot of the Talmud. Why? Mechinan lebe parzavta de nafcha. And we, they hit you with steel rod? Who hits anybody anywhere in the shul? This is ridiculous, this example. So why are they bringing this kind of language? It's going to tell us. <laughs> because your thoughts be th become the things that strike you. That our own thoughts will strike us and tell us Wait a minute, you forgot about me. You forgot that Baruch is the chariot of God. To say the word Baruch, you're creating a chariot. You're creating a conduit with that letter Bet and Resh and Chaf and, and Vav. So the thought comes and strikes the person. That's the metaphor that we're dealing with. Why does it come to hit us? like this steel rod, in order to fix it and to elevate it. Okay, so what we do, we stop, we recognize, wait, I just said Shema twice. Okay, Hashem, you're here. These thoughts are in them. I'm sorry I didn't have Kavana the first time. I'm going to have Kavana now. Why does he go back and say it again? Because if to say the first time I said the word Shema, that there was no reality, that I didn't know that the reality of God was in my fallen statements as well as my elevated statements, that the spark is there whether you praise the Lord or praise something much lower. Because I'm shortening the presence of God. If I say God's here but not there, if he's not in those words but he's in those words, I'm already, I'm, I'm minimizing the presence. And that's why the Talmud says, be quiet. You don't have to say it the second time. Isn't that beautiful? It's not coming telling you, that, Shh, be quiet, you shouldn't repeat yourself, you made a mistake. No. 
They're saying, they're, you don't have to repeat yourself. You don't have to feel bad that I'm not a, I'm not a davening with Kavana. You just keep going. You carry the ball and keep running. And the prayer will come. And the Kavana will come. And your attachment will grow. And you will learn to, to, to see that God is inside our thoughts. But not exactly the way we understand. So this teaching is, is bedrock foundation Hasidut. When you have this down, when you believe that God is driving your whole software and your hardware and everything that happens in your life, you can let go a little bit. Breathe deep. Enjoy. Because so much is... We're helped by so much, right? We're, we're being guided without us knowing that we're being guided. And if we just have to say, God, this is your day. Take it away. Whatever you want. What greater prayer could you have? Of course, there's a million other prayers. But when you give him the whole reality, that's what he's looking for in the first place. Now, of course, we're not done. There's another whole paragraph. I'm not even sure how much time we're going to... We're going to be here all night. Let's... I don't know if that's true, but... <laughs> let's see where we go. It's a, a crazy idea that Rabbi Nachman touches on in the Kuti Moran, which you can catch on uh, daily classes on Patreon. We'll check it out. He asks, an amazing question the rabbi asks in the, in the Talmud, when a chick dies inside the egg, you know, little baby chicken dies inside the egg, how does its ruach get out of the egg? See, because you see the way the rabbis are approaching a little chick inside an egg, it's still a living thing, it has a soul. And if it passes away inside the egg, which happens... My wife raises a lot of eggs here, a lot of chickens here, and we get some eggs, and sometimes they don't all come back, you know. We even just got a new incubator. Come by for an omelet. Where does the soul leave the egg? Because we know if there's a, a hole in the egg, the egg's not going to make it. And he answers, well, wherever it came in, that's where it went out. <laughs> so, you know, a, a clever answer would be, of course, the, the soul of a, even a chicken doesn't need to have a hole in the physicality because a spiritual thing can penetrate all physicality. But let's see where the Rav takes us. He, need, he says we need to explain this better. He tells us, look in Mesechet Brachot, and... Um, the ninth parak, which is a famous parak, which we've also actually we taught on Facebook last year. The ninth parak is uh, a ro a ro a is the parak that deals with making blessings when you see a place that a miracle happened, even your personal miracles, and it leads into afterwards a dream interpretations, which is really a, a fascinating thing unto itself. We'll have to do that again, hopefully together. So he tells us like this. Someone who sees eggs in a dream. What's that about? Well, he tells us, and a very interesting thing that you can see, only a rabbi could think of this, that an egg is a symbol of prayer. And you start thinking, what, why, why, what's going on? Well, of course, because an egg is something that's going to produce new life. And prayer produces new life. Not only in the person who prays, but in the person you pray for, and even the people around you. So 
So, Va'enyan, he tells us the subject really is She'ein lecha makshava shelo ye ba koma shlema. He repeats the idea we had earlier that every thought has a entire span of the sphero to the tree of life. Your thoughts are coming from there. Ach, makshava ra'a v'zara sheba'a al adam hi ba'a kedei letakna lo ta. He repeats the whole idea we had before that the, the, the strange or the, the unpleasant or what we call raw and evil negative thought, it also comes during prayer to be fixed. Now, if you just push away the thought, get out of here, I don't want to think about you, that's not the way we do it. Why? It's as if he's pushing away a full span of the tree of life. It's like you're pushing God away. Saying, God, no, God, don't tell, I don't want that thought. Push that away. I don't want that. Well, who's in charge here? God's not sending me my thoughts to punish me. He's sending me thoughts so that I can elevate them to a, to a higher place where they originally came from. And they got stuck in the wrong garments. The wrong vessels. Right? The wrong pixels. And when you push that thought away, it's like pushing away the Shekhinah. And he says, well, nevertheless, you know, there are thoughts that we're supposed to push away. that We don't want to think. Especially when we're facing the Creator. Well, the im nafshach lomar b'mada and if you want to say, Bimada, how will I know? How will I know which thought to push away and which thought to raise up? This is a full thought here. We're going to have to do it piece by piece. A person should contemplate if at the time that that strange thought comes, miyad ala makshavto, in immediately elevate your thoughts. How am I going to raise this up? How am I going to fix this? Then it's a sign that it is coming to be elevated, and we should see to it that we send it back to heaven. Now, how do you send a thought back to heaven? You own it. You own it and say, there is a spark of God in this. Now, I just wrote it in a book that I'm about to publish, God willing, with my brother's help. And we just wrote about this. Why? The idea is, is, is amazing. That if you're looking for love, now every human being is looking for love. It's the easiest example. But that old Kenny Rogers song, remember that song? Looking for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love is a good thing. But looking for love in the wrong places creates the wrong garment for love. Now, love can also mean the desire to unite with somebody. And if it's the wrong time, the wrong place, the wrong person, etc., etc., then we've taken a spark of desire from God to unify the world and create holy children and all that, and we've thrown it in the wrong place. So when, if you have such a thought and you stop and you say, that is a desire for God. I want to love God. I don't want to love money and all these other things that are running around. I want, to, I want my love to be for Hashem and for Jews and for human beings. That's a sign that thought needs to be elevated. But if the strange thought comes into your mind, and you don't have, the next thought isn't, I need to lift that up. The next thought gets worse and worse and worse. Or, let's just say, just takes you on a journey to, you know, to the bank or whatever. Az, mistama ba'a et adam mitfilato. Then, <laughs> we know it's a Yetzirah thought that's just trying to take you off your game. Because your, your prayer is on track. And, and he's going to throw anything to stop you. Like, you know, you're davening with desire and love for Hashem, and all of a sudden you worry about if the stocks are going down or up. 
Leave that alone. I don't need to go there. I'm in the right place at the right time with the right words and the right heart. Let it go. Dochev, push it away. It's nothing. I don't need to worry about my stocks. They'll keep going up. Pray more, the stocks will go up more. I don't know. Seems to, I, I haven't talked to many brokers about this, but let's just say. And then he says, V'az yesh rishut l'dchota makshavahi ki haba l'harokha eshkem l'arogoto. Wow. This is a chidush of the Baal Shem Tov. If the thought comes to take you out of your prayer, it's the idea of someone who comes to kill you, get up and kill him first. You're trying to kill that negative thought. You are allowed to push it away because it's not about an elevation of something you need to fix. But how do you know? Again, because the next thought after the strange thought is immediate to bring it back to God as opposed to stay, you know, somewhere in the parking lot. And then we can understand our little mashal about the little chick that dies inside the egg. How does his spirit come out of the egg, the place it came in? Well, what is it really telling us? Klomar. Now we take this metaphor of the living soul of the chick and we compare it to a thought. A thought is a living thing. That's what we really have to kind of have the paradigm shift about. Thoughts are living thing. They create other things. A thought that comes at the time of prayer is called an egg, something that has the power to give life. And if it damit, if it dies, da'inu Well, if you push away the thought, as if you're going to just let it go, kill it, finish with it, how is it going to come out? Again, he repeats the idea. If it's really a, a, a holy spark thought that's coming for elevation, you don't want to knock it away because it, can, it contains a real spark of something holy. And we answered, well, where our, wherever it came in from, that's where it goes back out. That is to say, that that thought actually is the, the negative kind that's coming just to confuse you and not for elevation. Let it go out. Okay, so you see how the metaphor works. This thought, if it's holy, it's got life power in it. And it wants to take you back to God. You know, and I'll tell you a secret. When you're eating, and you have certain food that you don't really care about, you know, just eating it, it's like a robot eating. You have no real attachment to your food. And suddenly, there's some piece of food that you really want. There's a good chance there's something holy in that food that wants to be elevated. And like the famous story of the Benish Chai, who was in a caravan crossing the desert. You know, talking hundreds of people and camels and donkeys, and everything, wagons. And they're crossing the desert and he tells his, his uh, servant to tell the head caravan master, which is usually a, a team of Arabs, would run these caravans across the desert. And you don't want to tell these guys to stop because it's not it's a lot harder to stop a caravan than a, than a speeding locomotive. It's just one guy pulling the brakes. Here you've got hundreds of people that need to be stopped. But for the Benish Chai, they were willing to stop. And he pointed over there in the sand. He said, you see over there? Go look over there. And the, the servant went and he found two figs out in the middle of the desert. He said, bring those over. And he brought the figs back. The Vanish High cleaned them off, looked at them, checked them, made a blessing. He said, okay, tell them to go. And everybody's like, what? Who is this wise man? Who is this old rabbi, this, this Kabbalist? But they carry the caravan on, and then the, the, the Shamash, the servant of the rabbi, said, Rabbi, why did you stop the whole caravan for those figs? We got plenty of figs here. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. 
those figs had souls attached to them. And they wanted to get back to heaven. And when he made a blessing with the true awareness of what a human being can do, by making the blessing on the food and eating that fig, the souls are freed from the fig and they rise up on the blessing of the rabbi. Now, not everybody's going to be able to hear this. That's okay. You know, each person in their place and in their, their faith. But life is an expansion of faith. And when you first hear these teachings and these stories, you're like, what? How do I deal with this? But when you understand it's all about the life force, whether it's a human being or a little chicken inside an egg, you know, even, you know, a leaf on a tree, we don't pick on Shabbat because that leaf carries life force. That leaf has the ability to create oxygen. Photosynthesis. That means it's alive. And a Shabbat, we don't want to end the life of anything. Now, some of these mosquitoes, I don't, it's, it's a big test sometimes in the summer over here. But really, seriously... We have to believe in the simplicity of the idea of the life force that's flowing through everything and we are the conduit, the, the switch between heaven and earth. We lift things up and we bring them down. And our blessings are designed by the rabbis to create that channel of speech through the holy letters that take the life force from a fig and send it back to heaven. So if we you know, had one moment like that in your in your life, you would you would never question again. So we still have this level. We have to believe in experiences that we haven't had. That's hard. That's not an easy thing to do. But you know, we're gonna get the Torah next week. Bezrat Hashem. You know, Shavuot is coming. And the day of the giving of the Torah is not just a day in the year. It's a time in the universal cycle that the Torah is being given again and again and again every year, just like Shabbat is. Every Shabbat, it's the same Shabbat coming down in a different place in time. And so too, this Shavuot, the Torah is being given again in a new place and a new time here, but it's the same giving. And that's why Rabbi Nachman said, do you hear the thunder on Shavuot? Do you hear that thunder? That's coming from Sinai. And it's still rumbling to this day. So I want to bless all of us with a holy Shabbat. In preparation for the Torah, of course, is Torah. Learning the laws of Yom Tov. Learning the preparations we need to, to do in order to receive that holy night, which will be a week from Rega, a week from tonight, folks. Better get on it, right? It's coming up, so it should be a wonderful day. It's uh, going right into Shabbat, so it'll be an extra long festival. And wherever you are, you can receive the Torah again. And if you go into that deep meditation state, I also believe you will hear some thunder. You will see some lightning. It'll happen right in here. And it will change you. And so that's a blessing we need to, to experience. Uh, and then we'll know. Because there's belief is above us. We don't know it, but we believe it. But when you know something, it's already inside you. And no one can take that away from you forever. And it will be passed on to you and to your children and to your children's children. So God bless. Thank you all for being there on Facebook tonight. We were supposed to be on webyeshiva.org and we had a little, some technical detail, but look, Hashem still made it happen. We got to learn the Torah of the Baal Shem Tov. So we'll be back next week on Web Yeshiva, 9 o'clock. Be there. And I also give a classes on Facebook, uh, Arab Shabbat, etc. Check my website, etc. You'll find all kinds of platforms over there. So we can continue learning together because this is where the life is really lived. In the infinite word of God. Shabbat Shalom.